when we were here, we went into detail. You can take that. Down, as to how the things we refer to as Holy Spirit, baptism of the Spirit, and so forth, really work. You know? Uh, we did a review of that, and we added something new. <laughs> the review was necessary because of the tendency for this information to be a bit complex, and it is. And, and I intend to move on today, but I, I do want to do a very modest review, which will explain, to the best of my ability, how do angels and spirits and God and Jesus and all of this stuff enter within us. And you will not have to have faith <coughs> to understand this. It's a work of nature. And it's entirely normal. Okay? Both, the last two times when I was watching with the television set up, because I only have I about 58 minutes on TV. And I always, the, both times I ran out of time on television before I could prevent, uh, present this to the viewers. And so I would, wanted to run through it. The, the basic problem with all religious thought, at least to me, is using reality, which is created. Now, you know, you say, well, I don't believe it was created. I, irrelevant. It's here, Where, wherever it came from. It's real. I mean, the chair you're sitting in <coughs> is reality. Um, and so people, then, are also reality because we're physical. Three-dimensional, uh, you have touch, and you know. So you know what I'm talking about: the physical grasp on reality. Well, if we take this reality that you and I are experiencing right now, and we attach that to these biblical stories and mythology, I try to come up with some type of proposition as to what the heck they're all talking about. How does it work, and, and what's going on? How can an external source <coughs> out in the who knows what, the source that we refer to as God or angels or Holy Spirit or whatever, how does that entity communicate or make contact with the human brain? How does the human brain, us, make contact with that? You, you can pray till the cows come home but there has to be a scientific way that things happen. People will say, well, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. I feel the Holy Spirit's presence. <laughs> and, and I don't know the ways of any of, uh, of these strange things that are invisible and are supposedly come in and cause changes in us. I don't know. But... When somebody tells me, you know, you have to have faith, that's just what I would just they prefer to say. I have no, I have no clue. I don't, I, I don't have any idea. The truth is that the ways of what we call God, as far as life on planet Earth is concerned, is based on one basic element, and that's electricity. Okay? Everything is based on electricity. <laughs> the human brain, all brains, are created or evolved <coughs> so that it can receive information and communicate information electronically. You know, you've seen, you go in a hospital, you see the guys laying there in an emergency or whatever, and the thing's going beep, beep, beep. That's measuring the electric in, in his brain. And when it goes that he's gone. So there's no electricity. But the brain receives and gives information electronically. There's, they have little local synapses inside and they fire little electric charges. That's not a maybe. That's a fact. And uh, it's something that we have to accept if we really want a mature approach to this thing that we call spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> spirit 
is electricity. And electricity comes in many forms. See? We're talking, what we're talking about here is radiation, electrical energy. To radiate means to, to send out waves, okay? That's what it means. Let me go to our uh, next slide and we'll show you. Radiation generally means the transmission of waves, objects, or information from a source into a surrounding medium or destination. All right, so let's put that together. We got that radiation. All right. Light, electromagnetic radiation of any wavelength. That's what light is. So radiation is a transmission of waves. Light is electromagnetic radiation of any wavelength. Okay? Now, let's put that together with the Bible. 1 John 1, 5, This then is the message <laughs> which we have heard of him and declare unto you, God is light. So what we call God is actually light, which is actually electromagnetic radiation, okay? Which radiates or transmits in waves, okay? Now, the Bible is the book that said God is light. And, and, and what I'm just trying to do here is say, well, who are you, what are you praying to and wh who are you trying to hear from if indeed uh, the book is saying that what you're trying to contact is light? Now, let's be adult. I mean, if we could be mature and adult and, and forget all of our religious beliefs and all this stuff. This is what I'm going to say. You know, if you're watching on TV, you're, you're going to... You know. When people go into church, all right? When people go into church, Sundays, they, use it, they are trying to make contact with aliens. That's what they're doing. I mean, you can mess around with it. Say, oh, I'm trying to find the Holy Spirit. Oh, come Holy Spirit. Oh, God. Oh, angels. And aliens. They're trying to make contact with the subatomic world of electromagnetic radiation. And that's what they're doing. People go into church and they kneel down and pray for aliens to come. Oh, alien, come into me. I say, oh, no, no, oh, I don't believe that's of the devil. <laughs> no, what are they? What are these things that you're praying for? And they are praying to the supreme alien to come to them and change them and provide for them. You know, I don't know if you've ever thought of that, but have you ever thought that all the times you've gone to church and you've gone to church many times that you were actually trying to communicate with aliens? Oh, I know you called it God. You call it angel, spirit, Holy Spirit. But what was that you were praying or singing to? <clears throat> Let's define alien and see if it fits. What, what we want to do is just take a look at this and, and as you do, see if this you know, kind of fits with what you went to church. Who were you trying to seek in your prayer time and so forth? Okay, all right? A being, someone that's a being or from or characteristic of another place. That would be reasonable. Heaven or wherever they come from. So we're seeking that. Okay. A form of life assumed to exist outside of the earth or its atmosphere. I'd say you pray to that. <coughs> Belonging to, characteristic of, or constituting another and very different place, society, or person. Strange. This is what people seek in church. Okay? And, and, and I think you're agreeable to that's what they seek. Now, hit it again and we'll see what that defines. An alien. If you look up the word alien, this is what it is. <coughs> so it's difficult. 
And now the description fits. What we consider to be an alien is what we go to church to attempt to make contact with. We go and sing to the aliens. We pray to the aliens. We preach about them. Now, we made up names. Like they do in mythology. To fit the particular invisible entity. We made up names like God, Jesus, Spirit, Devil, and all that kind of stuff. But what we are really talking about are beings from another dimension. Aliens. Okay? Now we've given the aliens names, but these names are names that are connected with our experience. Let me tell you, let me be the first to announce, okay? There is nobody in the universe named God. Nobody. Nothing. Okay? If you went up to this supreme alien and said, Bless me, God, he'd say, Bless you who? Where did it come from? Let's look. God. The English word God is identical with the Anglo-Saxon word for good. And therefore it is believed that the name God refers to the divine goodness. <coughs> so when you hear a lot of people say, thank goodness, same thing. That's thank God. See, so nobody is named God. It's goodness. What is good? Say, okay, let's take a look at the devil. The English word devil is from the English word evil. Thus, the struggle of God and the devil is actually the struggle of good versus evil. There is no such thing as God. There is no such thing as the devil. These are words that we made up so we could describe uh, you know, interactions in our own way. We even got this guy as an old fatherly guy with a white beard that sits behind a desk and all that stuff. <coughs> okay. So that is why we ourselves use mythology to call good God and evil the devil. It's exactly what Greek mythology does. They put names on characteristics of nature. Say. So when we put names on these invisible electromagnetic energies of light, we enter into a drama, okay? And, and then we can read about it and, you know, all this stuff. And unfortunately, we take the mythological names and the stories and all, and we take them literally. And we convince ourselves that, hey, there is someone named God. And there is someone named the devil, even though we made it up. By convincing ourselves that these are people, we park ourselves inside of a Disney-like existence. And just like little children, just like little children in Disneyland, the things that do not exist become real to us. And we never get a grasp on what reality is. Probably, and the key error has to do with another person that we have invented to turn us away from the reality of the essence of light, <coughs> and that is the word angel. Let's look. Okay? The word angel is taken from the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. So, the angel of light is God's messenger. Now that's the biblical taking, okay? Let's go and take a look at the scientific. Messenger particles are subatomic particles that are exchanged between matter and responsible for force. An example of a messenger particle is a photon, which is responsible for the electrical electromagnetic force. That word. Another word that we made up Albert Einstein, but nonetheless, when you go into whatever church you may go into to pray next time, tell them you want to pray to Saint Photon. <laughs> Saint Photon, the messenger of light. 
And you know the funny thing? You'd be the only one in that building that knew it the right way and was doing the truth. Look at it again. I, I don't believe this. Excuse me, everybody. Oh, my goodness gracious. I have to somehow get rid of this. Okay. Well, next week we won't have that. Okay, so the word angel, taken from the Greek angelos, which means messenger, so the angel becomes a messenger. <coughs> and in science, messenger particles are photons, okay, which are uh, responsible for the electromagnetic force. Now, the key here, the key here is the word angel taken from the Greek angelos, which means messenger. And, and that gives us the angel of light being God's messenger. And then we see in the scientific part that there are messengers, and an example of a messenger particle is a photon. So, come with me now. Our examination would be to determine if angels are really photons. Are angels really photons? Okay, let's go to uh, the Smithsonian NASA site. Smithsonian NASA, light's bending angle due to black holes from the photon sphere to infinity. <coughs> the bending angle of light is a central quantity in the theory of gravitational lensing. Don't, don't worry about it. The paper concludes by showing that the strong and weak deflection bending angle provide an approximation, 1% of the exact bending angle, who knows what they're talking about, value for light rays transversing anywhere between the photon sphere and infinity. What I wanted to get here is that the bending angle, okay, <coughs> is connected <coughs> to light and photon. So in other words, the light is on an angle. It's an angle of light. And it's a photon, which means it's a messenger. It's a messenger particle. So we've made a connection here. We have clarification <coughs> that angle light is photon. Light travels on an angle due to black holes and gravity. In other words, it's moving along and it's coming down. Everything is wonderful. And it gets near a black hole or, or, or some kind of um, celestial body and bang it, it angles. Because it's pulled by the gravity. Okay? Well, if angles of light are photons, then it is important to put together the key information that we saw in the last couple of slides so that we can reach a determination here, all right? <coughs> now, let's do that. First one. The paper concludes by showing strong and weak deflection bending angle, blah, 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 the exact bending angle value for light rays transversing between the photon sphere and infinity. Okay. So that's bending light. And that would be photon. Look at, stare at this word, photon. Okay. Next. An example of a messenger particle <coughs> is a photon. Which is response. So what we have proved here today is that an angle of light, photon, is a messenger particle. So in religion, we have an angel of light who's a messenger. Here we have an angle of light, which is, what does it say? Read it again. An example of a messenger particle is a photon, which is an angle of light. Now, the word angel <laughs> is taken from the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. Angel of light, messenger. Angle of light, photon. Here's the difference. The angle of light photon is true. Okay? The angel of light messenger is not. 
literally, but it is talking about the angle of light, which is the photon. So we're not saying that anything is unreal, but we're saying, you know, we have to become a little more mature and adult <coughs> and understand. The first statement here shows photon to be an angle of light. The second statement shows photon is a messenger, and the third statement shows the word angel means messenger. Now, is that enough to say that the biblical angel of light, that is God's messenger, would be a photon angle of light, which is a messenger particle? Let me show you how Albert Einstein <coughs> and uh, Newton determined the photon messenger particle. Right? There's no gravity, Newtonian gravity, and you see Albert Einstein. Okay, no gravity, Newton, and look at that, the angle of Einstein's theory. <coughs> so this is what Einstein said happens with light. Zap! It's an angle of light. It's a messenger particle, and it's called Einstein gravity. I wish they had made it go a little slow, but you can see it there. When you get to the Einstein, which is coming up, bang, you see how the, how the light angles down. So there is a messenger particle, okay, the light comes to Earth on an angle. Now, let's tie this up securely. Okay, we want to do that. Let's tie this up securely, and let's look at a comparison of the words angel. and Because what I'm doing here is I'm showing, and I'm prop, making a proposition to you, that angels do not exist, but photons do. And photons are the messenger particles, and they are available to you. All right, let's go. Let's see. This is the word angel. You know, an immortal spiritual being, <coughs> God's thoughts passing to man, and all this kind of business. Okay, for, both from the late Latin angelus, from the late Greek angelos, from the Greek messenger, angel. All right? Now, take a look at the word angle. Now, I want you to, can everybody see this? I want you to see it, because it's very important. Where does the word angle come from? Old English, from angel. Okay? So the angel and the angle are words that have the same root. Angle which is Einstein photon messenger particle, comes from the word angel, which is biblical uh, messenger uh, of God. Let's go to the next one. And we're looking at angle again, and we see <coughs> that it's from angel. And just like angel, it's from the Latin angelus. It's the same word taking on different meanings, okay? But you can see where we're coming from here. So we see the word angel, defined in the way we've always been taught. Now, the word then from late Latin angelus and the late Greek angelus, so we have an angel of light as a messenger, and then we look at the word angle, and we see it taken from the Middle Eastern word angel. Let's look at the next slide. <coughs> Oh, yeah? Well, excuse me. I mean, I bet you won't catch anything. So I'm proposing to you here, and, and this is, you know, it busts your balloons. It's like telling a kid, you know, Jerome, I want to tell you about Santa Claus. I mean, this is terrible. But it's the same thing. You're telling people the truth. No. There are no angels, but the messengers that come to life upon the earth are angles of light, which are photons. Here comes the water light. Well, isn't that sweet? <laughs> ah. So, what I'm saying and what I've tried to document for you is that there are no such thing as angels. 
But there are things called photons which do that job as an angle of light, they're messenger particles. So if a person, get this now, if a person is touched by an angel, they are actually touched by photon. And even the word photon is created by Albert Einstein. In other words, even that word, photon, is man-made, as does the word angel. Nobody ever heard of that word angel unless you're English. Well, you know, that nobody, that doesn't exist. You go in a universe to <coughs> some other place where they have a different language, they don't know such thing. But there's one basic element. Forget the name we're going to call it, whether it be photon or anything. There is this thing that nobody can really name but we try to just to identify. But there is this thing which comes down to Earth as a messenger of a higher realm cosmically and can enter into people. The words, in reality, there are no words. The only words of angels and gods and all that, we make up. So we can try to identify different sources of energy. But what you have to do is forget about angels, forget about photons, and just realize there exists an invisible entity that does come down from above and can enter into you. So that being a, an interesting thing, it, the photon is real, it's a fact. So when we go into meditation, or when we go into church, for that matter, we're not trying to be open to a visitation of an angel, but rather to be open to a visitation of a photon, which is light, and according to scripture, an element that will make significant changes in our electrical brain to raise us in a higher understanding. Keep in mind <coughs> that what we've been talking about here are angels of light, photons, light, and, and what we call... God. So what I have done, at least in my own mind, is change the approach to the element of the higher mind or God or angels from something requiring faith because we don't know, you know, that something is real. We have to have faith. Now, you take a person. You see what I'm saying to you? If it's a scientific reality, it's like digesting food or growing hair or plugging an electric outlet in. It works because it's a natural force. What difference is it what religion anybody is? It has nothing to do with religion. The lights that go on, go on. You could be a Muslim. You could be a Jew. You, if you flip the switch, it goes on. It doesn't care. Same with this. This doesn't go to people <coughs> because they're a particular persuasion or they pray. It has nothing to do with it. It's this natural thing. Now, how do we, as electrical instruments, and we are, allow this higher photon or higher electro or alien energy to enter us? as it's spoken of in the ancient scripture. How do we make contact? And wait a minute here. Say this is a photon. You want to take your troubles to that? <laughs> hey, uh, Dot. Cool, huh? How, and if that's what we're making contact with, what the heck's the sense of it? I mean, if a photon is an element, a particle of light, how is that going to help us with our problems? How, you, you can stick your finger in an electric socket and get a jolt, and that's not necessarily an intelligent force. So what makes this intelligent? So isn't it important that we identify or determine if the photon force we are opening ourselves to is intelligent? Is that intelligent? Does it know things? Can it make decisions? <coughs> uh, 
we are supposedly made in the image and likeness of this supreme photon. And that we call God, spirit, and so forth. But it's very, very important to me to find out, you know, what am I going? Am I going from something written in a book and, and saying, well, you know, this is reality, but what, how can I encourage you to get in touch with this dot? I want to take you to a book. The book is written by Gary Zukov, and it's called The Dancing Woolly Masters. Let me put the cover. That's the, that's the cover of the book. Gary Zukov wrote this, The Dancing Woolly Masters. It's an overview of the new physics. All right? Now, what I want to do in, in looking at this book is the proposition that photons have consciousness. You know, probably that's what you and I really look like. But we have the ability to enter into bodies. So even though we're just a little dot, do we have all of this consciousness and we can operate this body? But we, we use the brain. We have to have a brain because I have to communicate with her. You have to communicate with him and all this kind of stuff. In other words, does a photon have a cosmic mind like we do? And can that thing be able to think and make decisions? And, and when, of course, we enter into bodies, we transfer our decisions to the body. To the body. Now, let's look at something. As I said, it was um, Gary Zukov. And, 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 and the premise here, very important, in laboratory experiments, the photons had to make a decision as to what path to travel when flowing towards slits in a board set up to block their path. I don't have all of it because, you know, but you can get the book if you But let's go to page 88. There is no definitive answer. <coughs> Some physicists like E.H. Walker speculate that photons may be conscious. Consciousness may be associated with all quantum mechanical processes. Okay? Consciousness may be associated with all quantum mechanical processes. Since everything that occurs is ultimately the result of one or more quantum events, the universe is inhabited by an almost unlimited number of rather discrete conscious usually non-thinking entities that are responsible for the detailed workings of the universe. All right, a lot of words, but what we're saying is, does this little photon dot, is it conscious? Can it think? <coughs> Can it plan? Can it do? Let's go next one. Okay. Whether Walker is correct or not, it appears that if there really are photons, and the photoelectric effect proves that there are, then it also appears that the photons in the double slit experiment somehow know whether or not both slits are open and that they act accordingly. I don't understand, but that's not the point. What they're telling us here is that this knows the difference, that it knows, okay? It understands. And so it will plan to take a different route. This brings us back to where we started. Something is organic if it has the ability to process information and act accordingly. We have little choice but to acknowledge that photons, which are energy, do appear to process information and to act accordingly. And that, therefore, strange as it may sound, they seem to be organic. Since we are also organic, there is a possibility that by studying photons and other energy quanta, we may learn something about us. Now, what is being said here is that if the angle of light, which we said was an angel of light, and it comes down, and it enters into us, 
we have to understand that indeed it is photon, and there has been scientific work to show that that is able to process information and to act accordingly based on the information it receives. Ah, you're praying and photon comes. And something happens. Because the photon was able to process the information from you and change something, act accordingly. Do you see? I don't know if you do, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> The point is, yeah, we have an intelligence here. These little dots know. They know something, just like we know something. Look what happens. They, they change and go through the slit or turn away around and go through the slit because they know it. What do you do if you're driving a car? If you see an obstacle in the road, you take evasive actions. That's what the photons did. And we have an active update coming in right now, folks. I, wanna, I'll, I will certainly clear this up uh, next, uh, next time we meet, and uh, we will uh, eliminate this, that's for sure. But uh, right now, there's an active update coming in from... Uh, all right. So you got this, that photons are conscious, <coughs> and they are the angles of light, the messengers which come down to us, and they are conscious. Okay. And so, and, 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 and so this is where, uh, and what Gary uh, Zukov and these scientists reached the conclusion, that the angles of light, okay, or messengers or angels know what's going on and can make decisions. Now, you then also have to realize you are also light made in the image and likeness of the supreme photon, and you make decisions. And you know things not with your brain, but with your consciousness, which is in the realm of light. So we are organic. Now let's take a look at that word and see what, when it says photons are organic having properties associated with living organisms, resembling a living organism in organization or development interconnected a society. And that's where we're raising the level of that dot, because contained within that dot, according to these scientists, is consciousness. So the conclusion being reached in the laboratory is that photons are living organisms, they are internet connected, they are alive, and they are conscious. And so when we open ourselves in meditation, we are receiving the photon, which is the biblical angel, and it is conscious, intelligent entity that can rise, raise us to a higher mind level. Now, keep in mind, keep in mind that when we discuss the biblical God, there is a specific definition in Scripture as to what this biblical God is. Let's look at it. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man. Okay? 1 John 1, 5, the message which we've heard of him, God is light. So there's the Bible. What's it saying to us? God is photon. I mean, it says it. Cosmic light is photon. The angel is photon. And the Bible itself says it. So I don't so <coughs> why well, you know I should be so off the wall. What this means is God is photon. So you have no business using that stupid name God. Okay? <laughs> Heavenly photon. What's wrong with that? In fact, it sounds a little Star Trekky. <laughs> Supreme photon. I think it's terrific. <laughs> and you know what? It is the ultimate alien life form, isn't it? When we started all this, are we praying to aliens? <coughs> are we receiving aliens? The ultimate alien life form, King Photon, the kingdom of light, the light of the world. And we are created in its image, and thus we are Photon. Go and look at your birth certificate. What screwy name did you get? Where did you get that from? Two people that had sex had this and decided, what are we going to call this? We'll call it Albert. 
What did Albert have to say about it? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. There's another we're going to have in the next hospital. Uh, okay, a beautiful little package here. Well, let's stick a name on this one. What do you want to call it? How about Ethel? <laughs> I like that. We got Ethel Albert. Okay. But what I'm, the point I'm simply trying to make, that's not your name. That was given to you by some people. A lot of people put the names in a hat and pick them out. <coughs> what are we going to call this? Or they go to people. And, but that's not your name. That's their name. They gave it to you. and Somebody gave them their name. Your name is Photon. <laughs> When you pick up the phone, you answer, how do you do, the lady of the house, photon speaking. <laughs> but do you see where I'm coming from? All this stuff is Halloween. You know? You even look like those people. Get a picture out and take a look at yourself. You look like them. It's not what photon looks like. This is you, photon. Put that out sometime. Put that on. It takes, send somebody a picture of yourself <laughs> for Christmas. But it's true. But it's true. So it's not religious. It's not spiritual. It's scientific reality. How do we make contact with the higher photon and how do we allow it to make contact with us? Let me show you a scripture that is sir, uh, significant, okay? Don't worry about it. I explained all this other stuff, the shoulder of the ram, the unleavened cake. I'm not going to get into that now. But <coughs> I will, uh, come on, let's go back. Okay. The priest shall take all of this stuff, put them on the hands of the Nazarite, blah, 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 and the priest shall wave them for a wave offering. So here's the priest. He's got all of this, you know, dead cows or whatever he's got in his hand. And he's waving this thing. Who's he waving to? And did they really want him to be done? Of course not. But it's in there. There has to be a wave offering. All right? That's what the high priest had to do. Wave it so God will see. God will receive the wave offering. As I said, there's uh, all that other stuff I'll explain another time. Now, what does that mean you have to do? <coughs> do you run into the street waving a sheet or a pillowcase or something? No, of course not. There is something written by one of the preeminent quantum physicists of England, John Kramer. It's called transactional interpretation. And it shows you how the subatomic energies, photons, communicate with one another and it's one of the, John Kramer is one of the world's great physicists. And now, what, about, what were we just talking about? The wave offering, right? All right, let's look at the transactional interpretation. What do you see here is the first thing he talks about, the offer wave. And then there's the confirmation wave, and the transaction is completed. Okay? This is how it works. That is why you have something in the Bible from 5,000 years ago saying make a wave offering. Is it not amazing to you that one of the world's preeminent eminent, uh, scientists in showing you how all of this works says we start with an offer wave from the higher, a confirmation wave from the recipient, and the transaction is completed. That's the way it works. It has nothing to do with faith. It has nothing to do with spirit. It's a reality. It's exactly what happens. So the Bible is telling us about the wave offering. And then 5,000 years later, John Kramer comes along with his transactional interpretation of quantum mechanics. And the whole thing is summed up in this diagram, the offer wave, the confirmation wave, and the transaction. So it is with the scientific fact of the wave offering. It is an electrical phenomenon, and it is the only way to make contact with the higher photon and for the higher photon to make contact with you because this has nothing to do with church, nothing to do with religion. I mean, we have people 
Come on, I say, well, if you belong to our group, you're saved. I mean, does this make, when you know this is God, does this make a bit of common sense to you that there would be somebody up there <coughs> who, you know, because you don't smoke or you don't go to Atlantic City, it has nothing to do with all of that stuff. So we look at this quantum reality, the, the invisible world that we live in, and what do we see? At the top, we have the wave offering. In the center, the confirmation wave. Here, so that if you're, you know, make it a little more comfortable from all of the religious stuff you learn, there's God. There's Jesus making the offer wave. There's you making the wave offering or the confirmation wave. And once those two connect, the transaction is completed. That's easy enough to understand. See? E, or <coughs> E here, sends out an offer wave, okay? And then A sends out a confirmation wave. Now, you say, oh, geez, how am I going to do this? You don't do it. That's like asking yourself, well, I just had dinner. Now I've got to go home and read up how I digest this stuff. How does the hair grow? Now, you don't do anything. It does it. It's, a, it's, it's, it's simply natural. See, you remember, you remember the Bible story? I stand at the door and knock. The offer wave. If anybody will open the door, the confirmation wave. I'll come in. The transaction. That's what it means. In 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 in, in religious terms. <coughs> See? So in our meditation, we stimulate the electrons in the pineal gland which attracts the photon. When, it, when electrons become excited, they attract photons. So the photon is up there waving. Okay? And it's saying, hey, wake up. I'm ready to come in. And if you're in meditation, you automatically send a confirmation wave. You know, when you... When you're in meditation and all the thoughts are gone, you've made a confirmation wave. And at that point, the higher offer and the confirmation come together. Now, the offer wave at the top, say that's God, and the confirmation wave in the middle, which is you, cancel each other out everywhere in the universe <coughs> except <coughs> in the direct path. Look what John says, the awful wave, the confirmation wave, cancel each other out everywhere in the universe except in the direct path between the absorber, you, and the emitter, where they reinforce one another to uh, make this transaction. Say. Now, when I reply in meditation with my acceptance wave, nobody can't Nobody can interfere. Nobody can get between me and that offer. Okay? It only works in a direct line between the two of you. See? That's what it means I stand at the door and knock. That's what it's all about. The key, the key to understand this wave offering is that you have to be in meditation flowing in a harmony with the wave. I showed this the last time, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good picture. Uh, take a look at this. Look at this wave. My goodness gracious. wonder if you're turning around and facing this way. Why? It's going to crash you into the ground. See? If you're down the beach and you're not looking. But look what he's doing. The wave, the big, the tremendous, powerful wave, he is in harmony with it. He's riding it. And, and, and he's having a... See, that's what... You, you, you can flow with it in meditation so that the wave offering is returned with a wave offering of your own. So you're riding with it in harmony, like on a surfboard. So whatever you're comfortable with, God, angels, whatever you are, they radiate an energy which stimulates an abnormally large vibration inside of us which we call the baptism of the spirit of Kundalini and all this stuff. But it's actually an electrical stimulation 
which we've tried to define with religious words, but we'll only understand it when we accept it for what it is, electromagnetic radiation, which is the essence of what we call God. See? <coughs> so the next question would be, how do you do it? How can you take part in it? The waves are out there. They're heading for everybody. Most people have no clue. They're like uh, people like they're sleeping on the beach with the thing over their head. They don't know. Because nobody ever told them. See? So the question is, who's going to be responsive to the wave? Let me, let me show you a scientific description again from John Kramer. Uh, and, and this will be real quick. When an electron vibrates, it attempts to radiate by producing a field, which is a retarded wave into the future, advanced wave into the past. Don't worry about it. This energy or wave heads off into the future. That's us. Until it encounters an electron. That's the electron in your pineal gland, which is vibrating and excited, and it attracts the photon, which can absorb the energy being carried by the field. So in our meditation, we absorb this photon. We absorb this light energy, which then raises us to this higher realm. Uh, let me go to the next one real quick. The process of absorption, that's us, involves making the electron that is doing the absorbing bah, 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 vibrate. And that's why we say concentrate on the pineal gland. Concentrate up here at the center of your forehead. Concentrate up there. Because we've got to get that vibrate. And as soon as that begins to vibrate, then bingo, it attracts the photon in and of to itself. So many strange things are occurring throughout the universe. And we'll wrap this up. I'm going to show you something. And I, I was lucky to come on this. This is a kind of a moving picture. But a very strange thing, and, and the scientists are really at a loss to understand this, but over the North Pole and Saturn has formed a hexagon. And they, they can't conceive of how that could have happened. Or what I mean, uh, but they have taken time-lapse pictures of it from their, whatever they have up there, and I'll show it to you. And here it is. Right? that interesting? And they sit and look at it and say, what in the world is that? What's going on? So, anyhow, that's the story. And, uh, you know, hopefully it, it will assist us in coming to grips with the fact that, you know, we don't have to be a particular religion. Uh, we don't have to understand. We don't have to read anything. Okay? That this is all a natural element because, you know, it's just like when the body dies, this little photon, which is us, goes out and gets another one. And, you know, it's, that's the way things are. That's a, it's, it's a natural event. So knowing that, when we sit in meditation, we can just allow it to happen in and of itself. I remember the Bhagwan, or the Bhagwan Rajneesh once said, um, the grass grows by itself. And it, you know, doesn't ask. It just happens. And, and that's what goes on inside of us. Unfortunately, we, we've chosen to try to connect ourselves with people who will explain to us how to meditate or how to do this, that, and the other thing. And you can't do that. It does it by itself. Okay, thank you for being here. And we'll see you soon.